Good morning, North Livingston. It's good to see most everybody in the house of the Lord this morning. If you would, let's stand as we open our service. Go to the Lord in a time of prayer. We want to pray for um, Joe's mother, Margaret. She is having the procedure uh, this week on her carotid arteries. So remember her as they do the, um, uh, it, it, it's not a bypass, but they put the stents Put the, put the stents in this week. Remember her. Also, remember David and Connie's step granddaughter. Baby, not here yet. Okay. Okay. So, on, on the fifth, on the fifth, they will uh, induce and bring the baby, and then there's still surgery as soon as the baby gets here. As I understand it, Lynn has a procedure coming up. Remember him. Uh, also, Hazel has called this morning. Jesse is sick. Remember Jesse. Uh, continue to pray for um, Hazel's brother-in-law, Morris. Uh, he has surgery coming up. Also, pray for Kathy Adams' son, Chase, and continue to remember Amelia's family. Uh, I think everybody knows the uh, Miss Thea passed away, and that funeral was yesterday. So just remember the Jones family and the Ramage family. Also, pray for our uh, association. Uh, the search committee as we began the search for a new director of missions. As most of you know, Brother Rodney has taken the pastorate at Ohio Valley. So pray for him and Karen in this transition. And also there is a card, uh, a card of appreciation from our church uh, to Brother Rodney. And that's on the sound booth. We ask everybody that will to sign that card when service is over today. Um, I think that's all that I've got on there. Are there any other updates to the prayer list? Remember the family of Dottie Coleman. She lost her daughter this week, and years ago she lost her son. So she has outlived both her son and her daughter. So okay. Dottie Owens, remember that family? All right. Are there others? We have some that's working today. Remember those. Some traveling today. Continue to pray for those. Others have doctor's appointments and test results and things coming in this week. Some that have just asked in the form of an unspoken request, some situations uh, that they're dealing with in life and just said, pray for me for this circumstance. God knows all about that. So the Bible tells us when we come together, we're to pray for one another or pray for the household of faith. So as you pray this morning, just pray for those uh, uh, seated around you. We don't know all the details, but we don't have to. God does. God knows everything about every name that's mentioned. And the good thing is that, that he does know that. So you just pray that God would, would have his will in, in those people's lives. Paul. Remember Tina. Tina. For, for lack of a better term, Tina's doctor she's had for many years has retired. And so she has to get another doctor and he treats this MS in a different way. And so um, there's all that unknown. And so just pray for Tina and Joe as they go uh, this Tuesday to that doctor. And then Thursday, Margaret has her procedure. So just lift them up this week as well. Are there others? All right. Many needs, many needs. Let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for this Lord's day. God, we thank you for the rain. God, we thank you for the anticipated cooler weather. Uh, God, what a, what a blessing just to know that you're in control of all of this. And Father, you know that uh, some of us are anxiously watching the weather for certain reasons. And, and God, we know that you're in control and we just trust you with all of that. God, just as much as you control the weather, 
Father, you made these bodies. You know everything about them. Father, you've heard this list of those that are standing in need of a touch from you today, those that are standing in need of uh, procedures that are coming up this week, some surgical procedures, some test results. God, some that, that have some procedures coming in the future. And, and, and God, because of, uh, of, of the circumstances, there's some apprehension. And God, we know also that you give us peace and so, Father, we ask for everyone that's been mentioned this morning, everyone that's on our list. God, we pray that you would just be with those that are facing the unknown. Uh, God, we know that you know all about it. You know the end from the beginning. And God, we just trust you this morning. Father, those that have <clears throat> concerns in their lives and, and, Father, they're just not able to say publicly what that is. Sometimes that's for salvation of a family member. Sometimes that's for a decision. God, you know all about that. And Father, we join our faith together now. We lift one another. God, those particularly dear in our family, our circumstance, those in our, our circle of influence. And God, as we lift those names to you, and then God, we join our faith together and we pray for one another. We lift one another to the throne room. And God, we are so grateful that we know that we can come straight to the throne room today because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of that veil in the temple being torn in two, because of Jesus' instructions when we pray that we're to pray our Father. God, that we have direct access to you. We don't have to go through a man or someone else, but God, if, if we're your children, we can come straight to you, and that's what we're doing this morning. And God, what a, what a privilege, what a responsibility. And yet, God, we realize being in your presence God, just to realize that we, we are so loved, we are so cared for, that you sent Jesus to this earth, not only to take those stripes for our healing, but to provide for our eternal salvation. And so God, as we come into your presence this morning, we just ask for these things in faith believing. We ask in anticipation and we ask with thanksgiving already in our hearts because of knowing that you are our Father. You are the great physician and you are our savior. You are our protector. You are the one that comforts us when grief has overtaken us in so crippling a fashion. And God, we're just grateful for the opportunity to gather together this morning. God, I pray you'd be with Joe and the team, the musicians and, and the praise team as they lead us in just a moment. Help us to to just turn our hearts towards you, to worship you this morning. That's what this is, this is in preparation for is, is, is worship to get us ready for your word. And then God asks for the anointing of the Holy Spirit as we, as we share in your word today. God, what a, what a magnificent, what an what a awe-inspiring account today of, of how you work and how history bears out how you work and how you want to work in our lives just like you did in Israel's life. God, let that word just challenge us today as we share in just a few moments. God, as we go from this place, as David of old, we'll be able to say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We love you. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you with hearts of thanksgiving and gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Joan. If you want to come and share with us just a few moments, it's almost September and some things coming up. So you share and then Joe, as soon as she's finished, you come and lead us in worship, brother. I want to remind you all and introduce you all and tell you all, we are getting ready once again to do the backpacks. They are being ordered and the church will be purchasing the backpacks and we're getting 50, just like we did last year. And I think we ended up with filling up 54 or six last year. I think it's like 56. So it will be the same protocol. We'll be doing it the same way. We'll have a list for you all for what the what age groups you want to do. But be in prayer for that. Um, and I'm not sure yet uh, which direction in the state that these backpacks will go. But just remember, they're going to children that probably won't have Christmas. And Eastern Kentucky has really suffered this last year and a half. So there's a chance that's where it will be going again. So keep that in mind also and, and pray about that. I mean, just pray 
children are going to be receiving. Plus, we put Bibles in there, and they get hold of the gospel that they probably wouldn't have had the gospel. So remember that. Also, Eliza Broadus starts next week for state missions. And some of the time, we in Western Kentucky or in Livingston County receive benefit from that on activities that go on to help children in different things. So you all be getting together, get your bill folks ready and start saving. And so, but remember your offering, pray and ask God what he would have you to give to Eliza Broadus for state missions and also those backpacks. Now we'll have two months to collect for the backpacks. So you've got time to look and to save and to get what you want to put in those backpacks. But the church will provide the backpacks, okay? So you all be in prayer for those things coming up and just give God the glory. Be thankful that you can give. Be thankful we're a church that does give and you'll never out give God. Always remember that when you give from the heart. God will always bless you. So keep those things in mind. Thank you. There will also be a list and a couple of things that will be given out. <laughs> yes, there will be a list. And then and the church provides the Bibles that go into the backpacks. So that's one thing you will not have to purchase. The church does that. And there's a Christmas story. And Miss Amelia copies that off. And those, that Christmas story goes in those backpacks too. So there's some things the church will take care of. But the, what goes in those backpacks will come from you all. And there will be a list. And you can just choose whatever age group. So anyway, God bless you. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you this morning. Brother Danny said something about when we leave here to be in saying, saying that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord, but I've never been in a service that I ever left and think, I wish I hadn't went. But uh, we just ask God to be with us today and, and uh, pray His Spirit just fills this place up. Amen. We got any birthdays or anniversaries this morning? See none, or at least nobody's admitting, huh? <laughs> Mansion over a hilltop. You know, Jesus said that he goes to prepare a place for us that can't even imagine to be able to enter into the mind of man to what God's went to prepare for us. Uh, well, you made a comment to me about the bling that her mother wore. And she said, you know, she said, and, and my mom likes a little bling too. So one day they'll be walking down the streets of gold together. But thank God that he's gone to prepare that place for us. And he hadn't left us here hopeless, uh, without no promises. He gave us his word and that he loved an old sinner like me. And I thank him for that. Mansion over a hilltop. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and something else I'm gonna add. Uh, I seen I seen Jerry Wright yesterday, and I seen a, a lot of other people you just, that you see at funeral home, and I think, man. You know, we look around, and you think, man, you're looking a lot older. But I look at myself, and like I am too. <laughs> We are getting older. We don't stay the same. Uh, we, I know. <laughs> but thank God he's gone to prepare a place for us. And this is a temporary. It's just temporary. Mansion over hilltop. <laughs> i 
Glorify thy name.
before you, Lord, and, and humbling ourselves before you, thanking you, Lord, for that spirit that you have given to us, that guides and directs us, that speaks to us. Thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, we feel your presence here with us this morning. Thank you for each and every one that's here. Thank you for the ones that's watching by internet. Oh, God, fill their homes with your spirit as well. God, thank you, Lord, that we can call out on your name. And know, Lord, that you speak, that you stick closer than a brother to us. All we have to do, Lord, is speak your name and you're there. Thank you for that. Father, we pray for Brother Danny, Lord, as he comes before us. Just give him the words, Lord, that, that we need to hear on this day. Anoint him, Lord, from the top of his head to the very sole of his bottom of his feet. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Joshua. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the book of Joshua. Joshua in the New Testament is the same word, the same meaning as Jesus means Savior. Joshua chapter number three, one of my very favorite passages of scripture. I guess I say that every Sunday, right? But uh, I love the story in Joshua chapter number three. Mike told me, don't say story, say account. A story makes it almost sound like it didn't happen. But the account of the Israelites in Joshua chapter number three, Moses has passed away. Joshua has now taken over leading Israel Israel has been down in Egypt in bondage and God has delivered them. You remember the amazing account of how God delivered them after all the plagues and they crossed the Red Sea miraculously. How Moses stepped into the water, stepped to the water, took his rod under the command of God and, and the Red Sea was parted and all of Israel crossed the Red Sea and that's the picture of our salvation uh, coming out of the, the slavery, the bondage of Egypt. That's the picture of us being saved. The, the book of Genesis talks about how Israel is born. And then uh, we go on to the book of Exodus and it talks about how Israel is chosen. God's chosen people. And then you get to the, the book of Numbers and it talks about how the nation of Israel was proven. They were, they were tested and oftentimes they... They didn't pass the test, but God was dealing with his people. And then you get to the book of Leviticus and in the, the, the Levitical priesthood, you find the blood is introduced. And so we find there that um, they're brought nigh by the blood. And as we continue in the Old Testament, the story of Israel, you get to the book of Deuteronomy and man, that's some tough reading, but it's all the instruction 
that Israel gets. And then we get down to the book of Joshua. And God's chosen people face conquest and conflict. Some people say crossing the, the Jordan River is crossing heaven. Well, it's not because heaven is not uh, trial and conflict and war and test. But if crossing the Red Sea is salvation, crossing the Jordan River is our sanctification. And what we see in Joshua chapter number three Remember, sometimes it's written, the, the scripture is written to a group of people and sometimes it's written for a group of people. And so as we read uh, the Old Testament, it is written to Israel. Some of the things that happen to Israel are unique to Israel, God's chosen people. And the Christian does not replace Israel. I don't teach a replacement theology, but what I do teach is that God is the same. Scripture says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. And so God's character is the same. How God treats Israel, how God takes care of Israel, how God uh, protects Israel, how God delivers Israel, how God punishes Israel. That's the same God that deals with us in the Christian life. And you have before the New Testament in the Old Covenant, you have all of this physical things that, that happened with them in the physical realm. And then you have the New Testament and we're under the dispensation of grace, not law. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I came to fill it up. I came to complete it. I, I came to bring it to fruition, to to get ready to introduce the kingdom. The law was, was filled up. And so now we're under grace. And rather than all of these physical things happening, as it did with Israel, we live in a, 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 a stage of grace and it's more of a spiritual how God does things in our lives. But he's still the same God. And as Christians, we're still the family of God. We're still adopted. We're still grafted in. Just like they were the, the chosen children, so we are God's children. So when you look at an account in Joshua chapter number three, and you see what happens there, you, you apply that, you make application to that to our life today. And so we look at Israel in Joshua chapter number three, and the, 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 the main themes that come out is God's telling them, you've never been this way before. You've, you've not passed this way before. You've not been down this road before. So watch and trust me and see what happens. And this is what I'm going to do. And then God does it. And so in our lives today, the same God says, just as I dealt with them in the physical, I'm going to deal with you in the spiritual. And you're going to go through some things in life that you've not been through before. But I'm still God. I haven't changed. I'll still take care of you. I'll still provide for you. And if you disobey, I'll, I'll still punish you but I will still deliver you. We've been looking at the, the Old Testament minor prophets on Wednesday night and, and for all of the, the judgment God brings against Israel and all those nations surrounding Israel, it always points to grace and redemption and forgiveness when you repent. It always points to God has a better plan than what we think our plan is. And so we see Joshua I picture Joshua as just a young man. But when this account takes place, Joshua is actually beyond 80 years of age. Joshua has come out of that Egyptian slavery. Moses was leading and, and Aaron was Moses' uh, first assistant as his brother. But Joshua was there as a leader in the camp. Joshua was the one when, when they went over to spy out the land. Joshua was one of those that went over. And Joshua was one that come back and said, it's tough, but we can do it. Joshua was one of those that after having crossed over the Red Sea in that miraculous fashion, Joshua as a young man watched the people murmur and complain and gripe and say, you should have just left us over there and you should have let us die over there. And, and Joshua watched as God said, if that's the way you want it, I'll let you die here and you'll not cross the Jordan. There'll be everyone from the age of 20 and up in the next 40 years, you'll pass away, you'll die. You won't get to go over. Even Moses doesn't get to cross the Jordan River into that promised land. They've experienced the salvation. They've, it's just like us if we say, God save us and God saves us, but then we don't, we don't live for God. We don't sell out to God. We don't serve God. We don't live for God. 
And God says, okay, if that's the way you want it. And so for 40 years, Joshua has watched these people wander. What would have been just a couple of days journey into the promised land. Joshua has watched these people for 40 years just getting by. And now we pick up in Joshua chapter number three. And God says, it's time. 40 years has passed. The judgment has passed. Moses has passed away. Joshua has been chosen to be the leader. God has chosen Joshua to lead. Joshua is now 80 years of age. Joshua's going to live till he's 110. And in Joshua chapter number three, beginning at verse number one, the Bible says, and this is Joshua writing in as if his diary. I think Joshua wrote, wrote all of the book of Joshua, but just the last few words that talks about his death. And then Phineas picked up there and, and, and writes the actual account of, of Joshua's passing. But early in, in, in the stage of Joshua taking leadership, verse number one, chapter three, Joshua started early the next morning and he left the Achaia grove. He left Shittim with all of the Israelites and they went as far as the Jordan. They've been here before. They've been to the Jordan. They've been to the edge. They've been to the banks. They've been to the shore before. They knew what was across the river. Canaan, the promised land, the, the land that God had told Israel, this will, everywhere you step your foot, that's going to be yours. You're, I'm going to give that to you. But it's a walled city over there. Just across the river is Jericho. It's a walled city. It's got an army. It's fortified. It's not going to be easy to take. And so Joshua led the people as far as the Jordan. And they stayed there before crossing. After three days, the officers went through the camp. Now, Joshua's been talking to God. God's been talking to Joshua. And everything you're hearing here, God says, this is how you do it. And after three days, the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God carried by the priest, the Levitical priest, you are to break camp and you're to follow it. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between yourselves and the ark. Don't go near it so that you can see the way to go for you have not traveled this way before. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. God's gonna do miracles, but there's something you gotta do. God's gonna answer that prayer. God's gonna fix that situation. God's gonna provide, but there's something you have to do. Get ready. Prepare yourself, consecrate yourself. And then Joshua, verse six, said to the priest, carry the Ark of the Covenant and go on ahead of the people. So they carried the Ark of the Covenant and they went ahead of the people. And the Lord spoke to Joshua. Today, I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. They will know that I will be with you just as I was with Moses. Command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the water, stand in the river. Then Joshua told the Israelites, now there's, there's probably some two million people, men, women, and children. There's no microphones, there's no sound systems. I imagine Joshua would probably seat them somehow on the banks of the river on maybe a, an elevated grassy side so his voice would carry because he, he's commanding over a million men and their wives and their children. And he says, come near, get a little closer, gather in. I want you to hear what I've got to say. Verse number 10, you will know that the living God is among you 
and that he will certainly dispossess the Canaanites, the Hetherites, the Hivites, the Persiites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. If he were talking to us today, whatever your problem is, whatever your test is, whatever your trial is, God will dispossess that sickness. God will dispossess that, that decision to retire. God will dispossess that, that uh, do we buy the new home or not? Do we change jobs or not? Do we get married or not? Where do we send the kids to school? The problem, the problem, the test, the trial, whatever you're facing, to them it was all of the ites. To us it's all of our tests, our trials, our problems. Just put yours in there. God will certainly take care of that. Verse 11. When the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the whole earth goes ahead of you into the Jordan. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. And when the feet of the priest who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth, when those men's feet come to rest in the Jordan's waters, picture this, the waters will be cut off. The water flowing downstream will stand up in a mass. And when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carried the ark of the covenant ahead of the people. Now, Joshua says, by the way, this is flood stage. You've been down to the Ohio River. You've been down to the Cumberland River during flood stage. It can get pretty raucous. The Jordan, verse 15, the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. But as soon as the priests carrying the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water at its edge, it happened just like God told Joshua it would. The water flowing downstream stood still, rising up in a mass that extended as far as Adam, the city next to Zarethan, and the water flowing downstream into the Sea of Arabeth, the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. And the people's problems were fixed. They crossed the Jordan River dry shod. Verse 17 says, The priest carrying the ark of the Lord's covenant stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this lesson. God, I thank you for the application in our life. When we have the doctor's appointment, when we have the meeting with the bank or the boss, when we have the decision to make, do I take that job or do I stay where I am? Do I, do I sell that piece of property or do I hold on to it or do I buy that house or do I buy that car? God, whatever the circumstance is, when the child has gone wayward, when the grandchildren aren't living for the Lord. When we're facing, do we retire? Do we keep working? Do we go to church there? Do we go to church here? What do we do? God, we can see your hand. Just as you dealt physically with the Israelites, so you deal with us, your children today. If, if we consecrate ourselves, if we look to what that ark represents, which is you. God, these next few moments, let the Holy Spirit's anointing be in this place. Speak to each of us where we are. Speak to us in our journey, on our road, in our situation, in our circumstance, in our decision, in the middle of our dilemma. And give us the assurance, just as you gave that assurance to Joshua to the priests and to all of Israel. 
give each one under the sound of my voice that assurance today and that instruction on what do we do when life becomes a challenge. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can you imagine the Lord leading you in your life, in your problem, in your test, in your trial? Can you imagine the Lord leading you to the river and having the water of the river to dry up so you can just go right through? You know that decision is made as to what to do. And as I said a while ago in the Old Testament, Israel had come out of Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea some 40 years before. They had seen the miraculous. Joshua was young enough, he remembered. Most of those now in Israel are, are young enough that they, they probably have heard the stories. They've heard their parents talk about it, but maybe they were too young because everyone 20 years and up has died. And now they are told to go down to the Jordan. And when you cross the Red Sea, you're just going to cross over and you're going to be in the land. And then you are just a couple of days journey and you're in the promised land. And that takes faith. But you see, Moses walked down at the Red Sea. Moses took his rod. Moses was the one that had to strike the water. Moses was the one that God said, you do this and your faith is enough that they can cross. And that's salvation. Jesus did all the work. But if you look at verse number four, he says, now you have to consecrate yourself. Keep a distance of about a thousand yards between yourself and the ark. You remember the ark of the covenant, don't you? That piece of furniture that was in the tabernacle. And when Israel would set up camp, all 12 tribes would set up so that when the camp is set up, there's tribes on every side around the tabernacle, but the tabernacle is in the center. And in the middle of the tabernacle is the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the Ark of the Covenant was in David's time when the Ark of the Covenant was carried away when the enemies had come in and taken it and they were bringing the Ark back. The Ark was such a special piece of furniture in the tabernacle that they, that day they were bringing it back and, and they had it on an ox cart. And you remember that the Ark Oh, it, it began to tip on that cart. They thought it was going to fall off of the cart. And one of the men just reached out to grab it, to touch it. And he fell dead. It was such a, a spectacularly special piece of furniture because it represents God. It represents God's ways. It represents God's leading. And so God, God is holy. We think of God sometimes as unapproachable and when Jesus died on the cross, God is saying, not unapproachable at all, but you have to recognize who I am. You have to recognize that I am God, the creator of the universe. And so that ark being the piece of the furniture and overlaid with gold and inside that ark, you remember what was in it? Three things. The tablets that Moses had gotten the Ten Commandments on. The law of God. What you do and what you don't do. God's written law is in that Ark of the Covenant. There's also a golden bowl or a pot that's filled with the manna because that represents God's provision. God provided manna for them the whole time they were in the wilderness. God didn't let them starve to death. God always had provision. And so a bowl of that manna is preserved and put in the Ark of the Covenant. And then Aaron's rod that budded. The power of God is in that Ark of the Covenant. And so God tells Joshua you tell the priest to take that ark and this time they're to take the ark and it's to lead the whole parade. The Levitical priests are to take this ark and now instead of Moses taking and going down and taking his rod and striking the waters of the Red Sea, now when you get to the, the Jordan River, and by the way, it's in flood stage. When, you, when the priest get to the edge of the water. They are to 
They are to actually have enough trust. They're to, they're to have enough faith that the water is flowing. It's, it's in flood stage. It's out of its banks. It's going wild. And these priests carrying this ark, they're to actually put their, their foot into the edge of the water and they're to stand there. What are we doing? Why are we getting our ankles wet? <laughs> What's the purpose of this? Josh, are you sure? Why are we, why are we, what does this mean? Why are we doing this? And when they step into the water, the waters will be cut off all the way back to Adam. Now, all of the people are to stay back. What was it, a thousand? What does it say there? A thousand yards over a half a mile. I can't even see a half a mile. You're to stay back because you don't want to get ahead of God. You don't want to go around God. You don't want to skirt God. You want to make sure God is leading. So you stay back, but those priests that are carrying that ark, and they're carrying it by those staves that, that go through the sides and the rings, just as it tells them in Exodus how to do all this, and they stand at the edge of the water, and the people are standing back, and they're watching, and they're remembering the stories of the Red Sea crossing. They're remembering what's on the other side. If they get over there, it's gonna be war. All of the ites are armed and they don't like the Israelites. They'll kill them if they get a chance. You remember, they've already gone across. They've already talked to Rahab. They've already spied it out. They know what's over there. They know what's awaiting them, kind of like we are. We know what the test is going to be like, but we don't know all the details. We, we know there's surgery involved. We know there's a loan involved. We know there's a, a, a change of address involved, but we don't know all of the details. We, we think we know what we want, but we're really not sure. And we've got people coming to us and, and people talking to us and people saying, you really should do this. You would be good at this. And, and you're like, I just don't know. Why? Because you've never passed this way before. You've never been to this doctor before. You've never made that decision before. You just don't know. But God says, stay far enough back. Let me do the leading, but consecrate yourselves. Get ready, prepare. Joshua has been talking to God. Joshua has been praying to God. And God says, you tell the people, you know what sanctification is? When you get saved, God forgives you of all your sins. And then we have this big $10 theological word that says sanctify. Sanctification. God does the sanctification. Different doctrines, denominations have different teachings on how the sanctification exactly takes place. But there's another word before you get to sanctification. That word is what we read right here, consecration, consecrate. God sanctifies, but you consecrate. Consecration is where you say, God, your will, whatever you want, but here I am. God, I'll, 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 I'll do it. I'll go. I'll sell it. I'll buy it. But God, I got to, God, I got to know it's you. And so in that prayer, you're trusting God and you're saying, God, I'm, I'm giving it to you and God, it's not my will, but you remember Jesus, Jesus said, is there any other way? Remember, Jesus hadn't been born yet when all of this happened. Israel was, was, was going with a, a history totally different than we have. And yet when Jesus comes along, Jesus says, Father, is there any other way to do this? Nevertheless, not my will. But God, what's your will? God, what do you want me to do? And I'll do it. Man, when God said, Jesus, you've got to go to the cross, I'm sure Jesus thought like we would think, oh, I don't want to. <laughs> Is there not another? No, son, you, 
This is the decision. This is the choice. This is how it's got to be. And so God says, let the ark, let God go far enough ahead of you that you're following God. You're not going around him. You're not getting ahead of him. You're praying, you're trusting, you're saying, not my will, but your will. God, whatever you want. And so those priests, they take that ark, those guys that instruct the camp, they take the ark, those leaders, they take the ark and they step into the edge of the water. And when they step into the edge of the water and Joshua says, by the way, it's flood stage. It's not just a, a little old trickling stream. And this is so godlike. God says the waters dried up in a heap all the way back to the city of Adam. And then he gives another name there, begins with a Z of a, of a city beside that one. And all of the commentaries that I've read have said we've, we've searched and we can't find that city Adam. We don't know where it is. It doesn't exist anymore. But how ironic. The one that begins with a Z, and I can't say that off the top of my head right now, but that, that Z city, it's about 20, 30 miles upstream. And how ironic that God would tell Joshua that the waters are going to dry up all the way to the city, Adam. Who was Adam? The father of the human race. And Adam represents death. The first Adam represents death. The second Adam, Jesus, represents resurrection and life. And so the waters would dry up all the way 20 plus miles up to the city of Adam, to the, the city named after the first man, the city that represents death, the city that represents everything that you, you don't want. The waters dry up to there. Not just the waters of the river. I was thinking about that. I was thinking when I'm standing there preaching, how do, you, how do you say what that is like all the way 20 plus miles? That's as far as from here to where we live. The waters of the river dried up. Now get this. If the waters of the river dry up, it's not just the river, but all of the tributaries that run into the river, all of the creeks, all of the little rivers, all of the ditches, because there's not gonna be any water at all that's gonna come down because they have to know when they step into that water and that water dries up and they're waiting and, and Israel's back here watching some million men plus women and children, probably some two million people that are watching. And, and the, it says when they go across, Joshua says, when the priests get to the middle of the river, they're gonna be on dry ground. So all of this water that would come in, all of that water's gotta stop. What a miracle. What a miracle. When you have a decision to make, to somebody else, it may, well, that's not a big issue. That's not a big problem. That's not a big choice. That's not a big decision because it's not them making it. It's you. And you've never been this way before. God made a point to tell Joshua, to tell the people, get ready, prepare yourself, consecrate yourself because you've not ever done this before. You've not ever gone this way before. This is a whole new ball game. And so the Bible says they step out into the middle of the riverbed and because all of the water has dried up in a heap. You know what, a, you know what, you get the picture of what a heap looks like? It, it, it's it's kind of like that Cecil B. DeMille movie when he makes the movie about the Red Sea and the Red Sea is parted and it's in a heap. And I've seen the cartoon version where they, they walk through and they look over at the heap of the water and the fish are making fun of them, poke, you know, looking at them through the wall of the water. If you back up 20 plus miles of a river and the water piles up in a heap, that's going to be a heap of water. That's going to be a big decision. That's going to be a big choice. But you see, it is big if you've never been this way before if you've never walked that way before. And God says, you tell the priest 
to step into the middle of the river. And when they're standing there holding the Ark of the Covenant, everybody else is going to march across. I don't know what your decision is today. Some of you have shared. Some of you are going through decisions that you've not shared. Some of you are facing, as I said earlier in prayer time, some of you are facing doctor's appointments. Some of you are facing, do I retire or not? Some of you are facing, do I, do I buy that property? Do I sell this property? Do we build a new home? Do we rent? Do, what do we do? Do we do this job? You see, we're beyond that, do we have kids stage? Unless we would be a miracle like Abraham and Sarah. But some of you are in that place in your life where do we have kids in this day and age is the way things look. Do we, do we buy anything the way the economy is? all of the decisions and we're all at different places. And yet God gives us this picture of these people because when they crossed that river, it was exercising a faith that all of their ancestors had failed at 40 years ago. They were exercising a faith that their mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa failed at. 40 years ago, they hadn't been, not only had they not been this way, mom and dad hadn't been this way. Grandma and grandpa hadn't been this way. Do we do it or not? As a matter of fact, it tells us when they cross over of the 12 tribes, two and a half tribes says, we're not going. Two and a half tribes says, we're staying back. We're not, we're not going to cross. Now it, 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 it's interesting how it happens that those two and a half tribes do go over and help the others to fight. They do go over and help the others to secure the land. God does tell them, You'll, you, you go help your kinsmen, but you don't have to go if you don't want to. You can stay over here. You can stay over here, not consecrated, not sanctified, not trusting God. You can stay over here, just flopping around. But God says, if you, if you see what's over there, if you see the victory that's over there, if you see the gain that's over there, why would you, why would you not? God is saying, trust me. God is telling all Israel, trust me. You do know the rest of the story. When they get over there, they're not to marry the people and all of that. And yet Rahab, you remember Rahab's profession, right? Rahab wasn't one when the credits of the movie roll that gets the, I mean, you know, she's not a good girl. And yet God uses Rahab in the lineage of Jesus. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. His, I, I couldn't have written a plan that would say, just step out in faith. And here's a picture of what it looks like to step out into a flooded river and God to say, and I'm going to hold the waters back while you cross. Because if you're following me, it's all going to work out. I love this story. I love the way God uses Joshua, but I love the way God piled those waters up in a heap for 30 miles all the way back to Adam. God's got it. Just trust him. Trust him. God, I don't know what this doctor's report is going to say. I don't know what this week is going to bring. I don't know what this decision is going to do, but God, not my will, but your will. God, I'm trusting you. I'm consecrating myself. I'm, 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 I'm giving myself in prayer. I, I, I like also the way that, the way that God there, he, he tells Joshua, is it about verse number seven? He says, I'm going to, I'm going to increase what you look like. That's a paraphrase. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make it so the Israelites see you as a valuable leader in the eyes of, in the eyes of all of Israel. You're going to be I'm going to make it to where you're as great a leader as Moses is. And yet when, when, when 
when Joshua talks to the people, Joshua says, not me. Oh, look at me. I'm going to step into the... No. Joshua says, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. God is going to do miracles in your life. Joshua didn't say, I'm going to do it. I'm a great leader. Look at me. Oh, how, how, how God's raised me. Joshua didn't say none of that. Joshua said, God is going to do great things in your life tomorrow. If you'll keep your eye on him, if you'll let him lead, and if you'll step into the river. God will God will turn that decision. God will confirm that choice. God will give you peace. God will give you discernment. God will give you wisdom. God will grant what you need. If you keep your eyes on him, you follow him. And when he says, step in, remember we talked about Peter the other day when Jesus when, when, when Peter says, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to step out of the boat. Tell me to walk on that water with you. And, and Jesus says, come on. Jesus knew Peter could do it because he was doing it in, in, in Jesus' strength. His eyes were on Jesus. And it was only when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to look at the water and the circumstance. Now, Israel crosses the Jordan and when they get over there, they see the walls and, and they see the armies. And just like us, they get scared and they have to be nudged again. They have to be taught again. They have to be, they have to be led again. But as long as they keep their eyes on God, they were victorious when they got over there and they routed out all of the enemies and the land became theirs picture for us. Whatever decision, wherever we are, whatever test, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. And I know that you'll lead the way. Joe, come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Wherever you are in your life, whatever decision you're having. First of all, if, if you've never trusted Christ as your savior, that's the first thing you, you need to get taken care of. Israel had to look to God. They had to recognize who they were. We have to recognize who God is, who we are, where we are. We have to trust God as our Savior. We have to trust what Jesus did on the cross. But then wherever we are in our journey, we have to, first of all, do what Israel had to do. We have to pray about it. That Joshua was always talking to God. Jesus was always talking to God the Father. All of these great leaders were always busy about prayer. We have to pray to God about it. And then we have to prepare ourselves. We have to consecrate ourselves. God, it's not my will, but God, your will. God, what do you want? How are you going to work this out, God? And then, and then as we trust him, there's a, a phrase there from the Psalms that says we have to delight ourselves in the Lord. That means that we we trust God enough that it's a delight. It's not a drudgery following God. God, I know you've got this and God, I'm trusting you with it. And God, it's not, not what I want, but what you want. And God, I know if it's what you want for me, then God, I'm going to, I'm going to delight in, in doing that for you, God. I'm going to delight that you're going to give me peace in that decision. And then the last thing Joshua tells the people is just watch God do the miracles. Watch God. Work the things out in your life. He's a father. What father doesn't want the good things? The Bible says, what, what father, when a son asks for bread, doesn't, he didn't give him stones. He's your father. He wants what's best for you. Put it into his hands. Give him that decision. Ask him. And then watch him perform the miracles. Joe, what are we singing? Precious Lord, take my hand. Some singing, some praying, but all obeying what the Holy Spirit's asking you to do today.
When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. Look at this next line. If we can trust him, when my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. If we can trust him and we preach that, teach that, sing that, read that, if we can trust him when this life is almost over to take our hand and lead us to that unknown, we don't know what's over there. Every time I, I, I went to the nursing home last Monday night and prayed with Thea. The family was there. And I never stand beside a bed when somebody's taking that transition. But what my mind, and I'm sure yours too, is just flooded with the thoughts of what's happening? What are they seeing? What do they know? What's, what's going on in their mind and their vision that we don't see? Because we think they're just laying there catatonic. I told your cousin Yesterday, I, I think at that point that God is, that Jesus is, is there, the angels are there and, and, and they're getting ready to go and they're packing their bags, so to speak. And, 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 and we're, we're at that death watch. We don't know what's happening. If we can trust God and if we're born again, we do, we preach it, teach it, pray it. If we can trust him to transition us from this world to that world, Man, we've got to trust him with these, these everyday decisions. Do I or don't I? We've been in a decision lately and, and, and <laughs> I, I need that t-shirt that says, don't say it, it'll be a sermon illustration. I mean, we've been in a decision lately that we're, we're in a disagreement on. She says, yes, I say no. <laughs> right? And... And we've reached the point where we're saying, God, not what we want, but God, what do you want? Because we really don't know. But you know what? For 40 years, we've done that, haven't we? For 40 years. I'm not bragging on us. I'm just telling you that we learned it's the best way. Not, we hadn't always done it right. Sometimes we've done it and we've looked back and said, oh, we didn't do that right. And sometimes, most of the time, we've done it and we look back and we see, man, that was God. That was God that, that protected us. That was God that provided. That was God that, that steered us clear of that cliff. That was God. We've learned in 40 years of doing this thing called life together. I, I hope we've learned a little bit what Joshua has learned. When God says, stay back far enough that you see me, but you watch me, don't get ahead of me, don't go around. Man, it's so easy to go around God. It's so easy to get ahead of God. It's so easy to, to, to think, man, we got this figured out. And then we look and we see there's the ark back there and we're way out here ahead of it and the water's, the ground's not dry yet. Trust him, but follow him. Don't get ahead of him. Live a life of prayer. Joshua lived a life of, if Joshua learned anything watching Moses, Joshua, Joshua learned you talk to God about it. You, you build memorials to that, talking to God about it. And when God says go, you go. Man, when they got over there, God says you march around the wall seven times. <laughs> Man, what's in the world? We need bows and arrows and cannons. God's way is not our way. Trust him. He will never let you down. Father, I thank you for our time together. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the songs we've sung today. I thank you for the music that's been played. I thank you for the fellowship of this family. And God, as I look out over this crowd today, God, there are those with some heavy hearts. There's those that are grieving today. There are those that have some decisions to make. There's those that's facing things that they're dreading. 
And yet, God, their life is an example that they trust you. And so, God, help them in these next steps, these next days, these next weeks to stay behind you, to watch you, to watch for your promptings, to stay in communication and prayer with you, give you the credit, be in your word, delight in you. And then God ultimately to watch you perform the miracles because miracles didn't cease with the apostles. You're still in the miracle business today. God, I pray for each one under the sound of my voice that they will live in the miraculous because they live for you. In Jesus' name.